Hi, everybody. My name is Chris Hansen, and I'm a preservation specialist for the Utah State Historic Preservation Office. I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about preservation planning and how communities can use the planning process to help preserve their historic resources. Agencies can adapt this basic approach, too, in creating cultural resource management plans or other type of historic resource planning. I have a background in history and planning, and I've worked for some local governments doing historic preservation work before joining the Utah SHPO. I'm happy to be talking to you about this topic. I think a little bit of planning can go a long way in the preservation of our historic and cultural resources. I have been a witness to many successful preservation planning endeavors over the years. Here is my contact information, so if you have any questions and want to contact me, feel free to send me an email. So when we talk about historic preservation planning in the Utah SHPO, we're usually referring to a three-step process, which will be my focus. Preservation planning can include a lot of different approaches and have different meanings depending on the situation. But this three-step process is a pretty simple and straightforward way of looking at preservation planning. The slide highlights the three different steps in that process, which is survey, designation, and treatment. Starting with survey, there are essentially two types of preservation surveys you can undertake. You can do an in-depth survey for an individual building, which is known as an intensive level survey, or you can undertake a larger survey of multiple buildings, such as surveying a neighborhood or even a whole community, which is known as a reconnaissance level survey. We usually recommend that if a community hasn't done a reconnaissance level survey, that they do one as a starting point or baseline for understanding what resources they have in their community. When you do one of these surveys, you collect basic data on the historic architecture in town. Note things like style, type, year built, construction materials, building height, whether or not it appears to be eligible for listing on the National Register, etc. The image on the left is a spreadsheet with data that was obtained from a survey that we did in Tooele. After you gather your data, you then map your results as is seen here on the right. The image you see is a map that highlights the results of a reconnaissance level survey that Corey Jensen and I did in our office for Pangwatch about 15 years ago. We of course have much slicker GIS and mapping capabilities today. You also take photographs of each building. And as an example, what we found in Pangwatch's reconnaissance level survey is that there was such a large concentration of historic buildings citywide as you can see by the black dots on the map, that it was recommended that the entire city be listed on the National Register as a historic district, which is what happened. The city ended up hiring a consultant using a grant from our office to get this listed on the National Register. Our office has forms and instructions that provide assistance to communities interested in doing an RLS. Sometimes communities who do an RLS will find that they don't have a concentration of historic buildings in town for a historic district. However, they'll likely identify individual buildings that are worthy of doing more in-depth research on. That is when the ILS or intensive level survey will come into play. An intensive level survey is just that. It is an in-depth survey of a single building where historic research is done and recorded on a site form. Sketch elevations and site plans can be completed and floor plans are drawn. The image you see on the left is a floor plan of the Fryer Hotel in Deweyville, and photographs are taken. This is solid documentation of a building and forms a good basis for a National Register nomination if you choose to pursue one. So after you complete a survey of your community or an individual building, depending on what you discover about the property or properties, you may want to list or designate yet on the National Register of Historic Places or a local city or county register. The National Register is the nation's list, official list of properties that are historically important at either the national, regional, or local level. Just because it is a national list doesn't mean the property has to be nationally significant. It can be important for its role at the local level. The National Register program in Utah has run, about, run out of our office, and it's a popular program. And listening on a National Register is mainly honorific and incentive-based, meaning that there aren't re regulations tied to it. 
So if you're a private property owner and your building is listed on the National Register, there are no restrictions as to what you can and can't do to your building. This comic strip on this slide alludes to that common misperception. Another program is the National Historic Landmark Program. There are only 14 properties listed as National Historic Landmarks in Utah. These are exceptionally nationally significant properties. The Salt Lake LDS Temple in site in Salt Lake City and Fort Douglas in Salt Lake City are a couple of examples in Utah. If you have a preservation ordinance and preservation commission in your community, you likely have a local landmarks register or landmarks list. You can, of course, designate historic properties to these. These lists or registers are created at the local level of government and they can make these as restrictive or non-restrictive as they see fit in their community. Most communities in Utah aren't very restrictive when it comes to their local landmarks registers. They essentially create lists of important buildings in town that they commemorate and recognize as being important. They don't regulate work being done to them. However, there are a handful of communities in Utah who do have registers that offer some type of review and regulation. These require what is known as design review to be done before a locally listed historic building can be worked on, usually just the exterior. It's important to note that the local and national registers are separate and distinct lists and programs. They can overlap, such as historic districts or individual listings being on both registers, but they do need to be treated differently. After you survey and designate historic properties, you're ready to move to the third step, which is to treat them. Treatment can include pre-development work, such as doing a historic structures report, an architectural feasibility study, or an engineering analysis. Development refers to doing actual rehabilitation or stabilization work to a building. And you can receive incentives for doing rehabilitation work on historic buildings. If you're a certified local government, you can apply for grants from our office to fix up a building. You can pursue historic federal or state tax credits. You can apply for low interest loans from Utah State wide nonprofit Preservation Utah. So there are a range of options for treatment. As I mentioned, the three-step process of survey, designation, and treatment is the basic preservation planning approach. But there are also other elements when planning for historic properties in your community, such as establishing a good and clear preservation ordinance that ties back to your community's general plan and preservation plan, if you have one, or establishing a local landmarks preservation commission. And if the community you live in is not an active certified local government, it is important that one be created. A certified local government is a city or county who is certified through our office, the State Historic Preservation Office, thus becomes eligible to receive financial and technical assistance to undertake preservation activities within the community. To become a CLG, a community needs to pass a preservation ordinance and establish a historic preservation commission. Pretty simple, right? We have approximately 96 communities in Utah who have become CLGs. About two thirds of those are what we consider to be active, meaning they are actively undertaking preservation work in their communities and applying for grants through our office. The benefits of becoming a CLG is that you can receive financial and technical assistance from our office to do preservation work in your city or county. Melina Franco is the CLG coordinator for the Utah SHPO. Her info is on this slide. Please contact her about anything CLG related. And if you're not one, please get your city or county to become a CLG. So that was an overview of the basic approach to preservation planning, survey, designation, and treatment. Preservation planning and the planning process leads to other activities. I have a list here of some of those activities on this slide. And preservation planning is key to establishing public policies and strategies that can help prevent the loss of historic resources. The process can provide a forum for community discussion and can be an educational tool. This includes important questions such as when and where it may be appropriate to demolish historic buildings and what resources should be protected to maintain the community's unique historic and architectural character. This is the foundation to a solid preservation program. Thank you all for your time. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me.
Our office does have a preservation planning guide. If you're interested, please reach out to me and I will send it to you. Thank you.